This presentation will provide an overview of the sources of animal welfare regulation in Australia. I'll begin by looking at the growing role of the Commonwealth Government um, in animal welfare, specifically through the Australian Animal Welfare Strategy and the Model Codes of Practice. Next, I'll review the state and territory-based um, animal welfare legislation, which accounts for the majority of the animal welfare laws in Australia. At this point, I'll discuss the effect that prescribing or developing a code practice can have on the actual protection afforded to animals under the state and territory laws. Finally, I will briefly discuss the often overlooked third tier of government, the local government, and its effect on animal welfare legislation. So this presentation will not, however, consider the issues of enforcement of these laws um, in order to keep with the time allotted. However, it's worth keeping these issues in mind as we progress through this presentation. It, it's all well and good to have these laws, but if they're not adequately enforced, then arguably their role is only symbolic. Okay, so at the, um, under the Australian federal system of government, the Commonwealth is restricted to legislating on areas that are specified in the Constitution. Now, these are referred to as heads of power. All other areas are left to the states and territories to legislate on. The Commonwealth heads of power are located in uh, Section 51 of the Constitution. And a quick spoiler alert before you pull out your trusty, handy copy of the Constitution, <laughs> but there is no uh, specific head of power for animal welfare. In spite of this, though, the Commonwealth Government has been able to pass um, a number of laws that indirectly regulate aspects of animal welfare principally under the Trade and Commerce, the Quarantine, the Fisheries and the Foreign Affairs Heads of Power. These and other Heads of Power have been used by the Commonwealth to legislate in respect of live animal export and animals processed at export registered slaughter establishments. The Commonwealth also has overall responsibility for the welfare of kangaroos killed for commercial purposes, the welfare aspects of introduced and wild animal management, and animal research on Australian government lands. The fact that the Australian Constitution doesn't mention animal welfare is not unusual, and Antoine mentioned this. In fact, um, there's very few Western, or should I say non-European countries, um, who have amended their Constitution to recognise the interests of animals. And uh, one of the few countries to do so is Switzerland, as Antoine mentioned, in 1992, which added uh, the dignity of animals to its Constitution. However, uh, such a move hasn't occurred here in Australia yet today. The Australian Animal Welfare Strategy, as its name suggests, is not law. However, it does play a significant role in shaping state and territory legislation. The Australian Animal Welfare Strategy was developed by the Commonwealth um, with the assistance and advice of the National Consultative Committee um, on animal welfare, and this has been recently renamed to the Australian Animal Welfare Advisory Committee. In May 2004, the Primary Industries Ministerial Council approved this strategy, and the aim of the Australian Animal Welfare Strategy is to provide a direction for the development of future animal welfare policies through national consultation and a firm commitment of high standards of animal welfare. Now, this aim highlights a criticism of the Australian animal welfare strategy in the literature, and that is its acceptance of the existing regulatory framework, in which it only seeks to refine and promote, rather than provide a critical re-examination of the animal protection regime, which is what many scholars suggest is required. Staying at the national level, the model codes of practice provide minimum standards and specify the duty of care to be given to animals. As I'll discuss later, these model codes of practice can either be directly adopted uh, by the states or territories through their animal welfare legislation, or they may serve as a foundation for their own code of practice tailored to meet their specific regional needs. The model codes of practice are, uh, were, sorry, were initially drafted back in the 1980s and are currently uh, being revised and rewritten as national standards and guidelines. What is worth noting here is how the model codes of practice are being revised to the national standards and guidelines. To manage this process, the Australian Government, uh, Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, commissioned Animal Health Australia to manage the conversion process. 
Animal Health Australia is a not-for-profit public company established by Commonwealth, state and territory governments and industry, uh, livestock industry bodies. Its members include the Australian Pork Limited and Australian Egg Corporation. And its company vision is for a robust national health system that maximises competitive advantage and preferred market access for Australia's livestock industries. Although the process managed by Animal Health Australia includes consultation with animal protection organisations and the general public, their involvement comes much later in the process. <laughs> they are only allowed to comment on the drafts of the revised standards as a part of the reference group. But they are not involved in the initial drafting, despite the fact that these are called uh, animal welfare standards. This is troubling because according to an academic Dale, the initial drafting process has a very powerful influence and sets the tone for the entire process, uh, normally leading to a final version that is favourable towards the industry that initiated or was at least involved in the drafting process. Now, Dale was um, specifically writing in respect to the development of the New Zealand Code of Welfare, but this highlights the need to have representation from animal welfare organisations at the initial drafting stages. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, under the federal constitution, the states and territories have primary jurisdiction for animal welfare in Australia. Although there are a number of differences that exist between the different states and territory acts, the basic features of the laws are the same. Specifically, every state and territory, it, it, it's illegal to be cruel to an animal. This general overarching prohibition against cruelty is expressed in broad terms, and with the exception of the ACT, is restricted by general words of qualification. Basically, cruelty is prohibited so long as the pain imposed on animals is not unjustifiable, unreasonable or unnecessary. In New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia and the ACT, uh, there is also an offence of aggravated cruelty, which imposes harsher penalties for causing death or serious injury to an animal. A recent trend in uh, the state and territory animal welfare legislation is the imposition of a positive duty of care. A positive duty of care recognises that animal welfare requires more than just prohibiting cruelty. So, for example, in uh, Section 13.3.B.1 of the South Australian Animal Welfare Act, it's an offence for an owner of an animal to not provide appropriate and adequate food, water, living conditions, whether they be temporary or permanent, or exercise. Whilst the core principles may be the same, there are some important distinctions between the Animal Welfare Acts across Australia. Most notably, what constitutes an offence. For instance, the offence may be one of cruelty, causing harm or ill treatment, depending on where you are. Even the definition of an animal may vary in the legislation. In particular, in South Australia and Western Australia, fish are specifically excluded from the definition of an animal, effectively, li effectively lifting any uh, statutory protection these animals may otherwise have. There are also differences in uh, who is liable to prosecution, though uh, this generally lies with the person in charge or the person responsible for the animal. And finally, there is also wide variation in the maximum penalties for breaching animal welfare laws. In addition to the animal welfare statutes that I've just uh, mentioned in the last two slides, most states and territories have numerous codes of practice to regulate socially acceptable uses of animals in our society. Principally, codes of practice regulate activities such as farming, scientific research and the transport of livestock. These codes may be based on the model codes of practice, standards or guidelines, or in, either in their entirety, uh, entirety sorry, and uh, or the state or territory may use these as a base to develop their own. Compliance with these codes of practice is generally voluntary. Uh, in fact, South Australia is the only state in Australia where compliance with a code of practice is enforceable under the animal welfare regulations. In all other states and territories, the incentive for complying with a relevant code of practice is the fact that the evidence of compliance is either a defence or an exemption from prosecution under the animal welfare laws.
There are two minor exemptions, uh, exceptions sorry, to this. In Tasmania, only the uh, codes of practice for animal research and uh, rodeos uh, is mentioned in the Act, so it is unclear what effect compliance with another model code of practice would have on the charge of cruelty. And in New South Wales, compliance or non-compliance with the code of practice in respect of farm and companion animals is admissible evidence in the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, rather than a specific exemption or defence. The major criticism of the codes of practice that I really want to press on you here tonight is that they generally provide for a lower level of protection from cruelty than the, uh, than, than the animal would have enjoyed under the animal welfare legislation. In fact, one could argue that the reason for developing these, these codes of practice is to lift the statutory protections that would have otherwise protected a particular class of animal so that they can be treated uh, according to industry practice. To illustrate this point, consider the example of sow stalls and farrowing crates in intensive pig industries. South Australia has adopted the model code of practice for the welfare of animals specifically relating to pigs. And sow stalls and farrowing crates, for those unfamiliar with it, are approximately um, half a metre wide by two metres long, so uh, approximately my height and width. And these are used to confine pregnant sows and postnatal sows for up to 16 or 6 weeks, respectively. According to the RSPCA and Voiceless, confinement in these uh, stalls and crates causes physical harm and psychological stress to these uh, intelligent and social animals. If someone was to confine their dog in similar and proportionate conditions, their proportionate conditions then it's very likely that this would be illegal under the Animal Welfare Act. However, as the model of code of practice for pigs has been prescribed in South Australia, none of the protections in the Animal Welfare Act apply so long as the pig producers meet the requirements in the code. In sum, the very fact that these codes and exemptions ex uh, exist suggests that the treatment of these animals would otherwise be illegal under the state and territory legislation. According to academics O'Sullivan and White, this makes the law internally inconsistent and irrational, as farmed animals are treated differently from companion animals, despite the fact that both of these animals are sentient creatures with the ability to feel pain and fear. The final tier of the animal welfare laws in Australia is the local government regulations. Local governments have responsibility for some areas of domestic and unwanted animal control and public health that impacts on animal welfare. This is often overlooked as a source of regulation that affects animal welf the welfare of animals. However, I think recently this has changed with the growing public awareness of the management of companion animals and the uh, broader effects that this can have on animal welfare issues. Generally, the local governments are empowered to regulate through the operation of state and territory legislation. In South Australia, the Dog and Cat Management Act gives the council the ability, the local council, the ability to respond to the needs and wishes of their communities, uh, which may vary according to local social, environmental and other factors. Under this act, councils are required to formulate and regularly review animal protection plans, uh, animal management plans, to manage shared urban spaces and other relevant matters. It also enables local governments to undertake cat management strategies which can include registration, compulsory desexing, confinement, and limiting the number of cats a resident is able to keep. Therefore, good animal management plans and local government bylaws can play a valuable role in uh, protecting companion animals from unnecessary pain and suffering. To apply the example I just mentioned, by the council limiting the number of cats a resident may be able to, uh, may be able to keep, they can reduce the instances of hoarding and the deplorable conditions these animals are often kept in. So to conclude, at all three tiers of government, we have animal welfare laws and regulations operating. The Commonwealth Government's legislative capabilities are restricted to the heads of power under the Constitution. This has allowed it to legislate in respect of live animal export, commercial slaughter of kangaroos, the welfare aspects of introduced and wild animal management and the animal research on Australian government lands. In addition, the Commonwealth Government is increasingly playing a leadership role in the harmonisation of state and territory laws 
through the Australian Animal Management Strategy and its involvement in the model and the development of model codes of practice, standards and guidelines. The local government is also limited in its ability to regulate domestic and unwanted animals. However, this um, powers to regulate are restricted by state and territory legislation. It's the state and territories that have the primary jurisdiction for animal welfare legislation. Every state and territory in Australia prohibits cruelty as a general principle, although this is qualified to situations where cruelty is unnecessary, unjustifiable or unreasonable. To avoid the courts determining whether certain industry practices are unnecessary, unreasonable or unjustifiable, numerous codes of practice have been introduced to regulate socially acceptable uses of animals in our society, particularly in relation to livestock, which accounts for the largest use of animals in Australia. The effect of these codes is to lift the statutory protections from cruelty or harm. So producers can perform surgical procedures without anaesthesia, confine animals to cages and stalls that prevent them from performing normal behaviours, deprive them of food and water for extended periods of time, and even kill them. These codes often legalise an act that would otherwise be illegal under the relevant animal welfare legislation. Thank you very much for your attention, everyone. Just, just some references for the